When I showed you our atomic shelter in video number 151, I really thought that the Cold War is over and these shelters are a thing of the past. Just a few days later, I had to learn that this is not true anymore. Is it necessary again that we own our own Geiger counter to alarm us if radioactivity is in the air? If you think, yes, it is necessary, you will find how you can build one for about $50. Gritty YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode around sensors and microcontrollers. In the past, Geiger counters were quite exclusive and expensive tools, and they still are if you need a sensitive and accurate tool. For our purpose to monitor our environment and alarm us if something really bad happens, we do not need a high sensitivity nor a high accuracy. We need comparable numbers to spot a trend. And we are not interested in smallest doses. To build a device with these specifications it's relatively cheap and simple. And it works. And as usual, it will be connected to the internet. Today we will build such a device which will do long-term monitoring of our environment and alarm us immediately if radioactivity increased fast. Because a bomb or only the closest atomic power plant exploded. Because of the urgency of this project, I changed the format of the video. We will first build it and only afterwards I will show you how such a device works and also why I think its accuracy is okay. So the practical viewers do not need to lose time with the bloody theory, which is anyway only for the nerds. Fortunately, we can buy a prefabricated Geiger counter at our preferred Chinese suppliers. It works quite well, but documentation is not the best. One important thing also for the practical viewers. The Geiger-Müller tube on the device works with a few hundred volts. This is why I mounted the plexiglass on top of the PCB. The brass stands are too short, but if you use the long and the short in series, they are long enough. I used long nylon stands instead. We have to power the counter with 5 volts and it consumes around 15 mA. The power can come via this DC jack, through these terminals or through the DuPont pin on the other side. As soon as we power the device, it starts to tick randomly with the well-known Geiger counter sound. But the clicks are quite rare. Not like in the old James Bond movies where the bad guys sometimes played with plutonium. The sound comes from a built-in loudspeaker and would be sufficient to alarm you if you are near the device. But we want more. This is why I connect the digital output to one pin of my ESP32 board. Of course, you can also use an ESP8266 or any other microprocessor. Again, I use the one with the OLED display because it's so handy. Now you can create a channel on ThingSpeak, download the Arduino Eno file from GitHub, add your Wi-Fi and ThingSpeak credentials and upload it to the ESP. Then you should see the number of ticks per minute on the display. Or if you do not have a display, in serial. And if you go to your channel on ThingSpeak, you see the values coming in. Like that, you can do a long-term monitoring of the natural radioactivity in your area. Or even could add some MATLAB stuff. But this is definitely only for the nerdiest of the nerds. Now you can stick the ESP to the plexiglass using a small piece of double-sided tape or you can print a 3D enclosure, mount the two boards inside and place it somewhere in your house. I did some testing and found out that placing it in the basement reduced the counts per minute about one third. We still get a lot of hits below the earth surface because the parts we measure especially the beta and gamma parts are so fast and strong that they pass all our walls. And of course, I also went to our fallout shelter shown in video number 151. Also here we can measure some natural activity. Or is it mostly the background noise of the tube? If we deduct the 12 CPM background noise, 
we really have a very low radioactivity in the basement and in the shelter. The practical part is now done and you can start to build your own device. Only if you are interested in some theory or if you want to add an alarm feature which sends an alarm to your smartphone, if radioactivity is high, you have to stay. First question, how accurate is this device? I found an academic paper where the students were able to detect changing radioactivity during heavy rainfalls. So I'm pretty sure that our device will be able to detect unhealthy events. You find a link to this paper in the video description. Geige Müller tubes can detect ionizing radiation like alpha particles, beta particles and gamma rays. You can buy them in different shapes and from different sources. This sport uses the Chinese J305 tube, because these tubes cannot detect the energy, just the presence of such events, we count the number of ionizing events per minute. But where do these impulses in the loudspeaker come from and where do we find an Arduino compatible signal? Because I did not find a diagram, I had to re-engineer the device. The signal comes from the tube itself which is operated at the voltage of around 400 volts. It is produced each time an ionization occurs. The signal comes through this capacitor and looks like that. It has an amplitude of 600 millivolt and a duration of around 500 microseconds. So we could detect nearly 2000 events per second or 100,000 per minute. But because these tubes have a dead time in between such events, the maximum this particular tube can handle seems to be 1800 events per minute. So this timing is definitely no issue here. After the first amplification in Q3, the signal goes to a DuPont pin and to the trigger input of an NE555 chip. This chip is configured as a monostable vibrator. Each time it is triggered, it creates a positive impulse with a length of about 700 microseconds. This impulse is shown by the red LED and also made audible by the small speaker. It creates the typical sound. If we add this jumper, we can even hear the sound in the 3.5 mm jack. The output pin is wrongly named V-in, but now we know better and connect it to the input pin of the ESP32. We can connect it directly to this pin because it has a high impedance and the voltage is immediately reduced to around 3.5 volts, which is inside the specs of the ESP32. Now we can trigger an interrupt inside the ESP32. The interrupt service routine or ISR routine then counts up each time such a trigger occurs. We trigger the interrupt on the falling edge because we have a negative signal. Interrupts have the advantage that they do not interfere with the main loop. They somehow run in the background. Now let's continue with the main sketch. We need some libraries to display the values on the OLED display and to send an event to IFTTT. And because IFTTT needs a secure connection, we also need Wi-Fi client secure. ThingSpeak still accept insecure calls. I place all my credentials in a file called credentials.h and place this file in my libraries folder. Like that I can only include this file name in my sketches and have all credentials available. If you want to do the same thing, just move all define credentials into this file. If not, define all credentials in this sketch and delete the include credentials.h line. The setup is simple. It initializes the display, connects to Wi-Fi, enables interrupts and attaches the interrupt to the pin coming from the Geiger counter. In this statement, you also find the name of the interrupt service routine. The loop also is quite simple. It loops and does nothing until the lock period has expired. Be aware, doing nothing still means that the ISR counts all events from the Geige counter. Then it runs through this part of the sketch and adjusts the number of events counted during the log period to one minute. 
our lock period is 20 seconds because ThinkSpeak only accepts one call per 15 seconds. If we count 13 events in 20 seconds, for example, it means that we would have three times more in 60 seconds or one minute. This is why we have to multiply it by three. For a long-term project, you might want to send an update every five minutes. So the lock period would be 300,000 milliseconds. In this part, we also update ThingSpeak and test if the value is high enough to alarm us via the webhooks service of IFTTT. And of course, we display the actual reading on the OLED display. It is easy to set up ThingSpeak. First, you create your account if you do not have one. It is free with a limited performance. Then you create a new channel with only one field, radioactivity. All other fields can be left empty. Set the channel to private. Now you have to copy the channel number and the write API key to your sketch. You are done with things speak. With IFTTT, it is a little more complex. IFTTT always connects two services, an event and an action. In our case, the event is coming from webhooks and we want to send an IFTTT notification to our smartphone. We could also send an SMS, but these are limited to only 10 SMS per month. But hopefully this is okay for a radioactivity alarm. I discovered this limitation too late, so I changed to IFTTT notifications, which is also good. By the way, Webhooks was called Maker Channel in the past. Fortunately, only the name changed. So first we have to create our Webhooks service. Here you get a key which has to be copied in your sketch. Be aware that this key changes every time you press this button and you have to update your sketch. Then we have to connect our smartphone to IFTTT. Just install the app and follow the instructions. We have now two services connected with our devices. The webhooks with the ESP32 and the notification with our smartphone. This is the basis for the next step. You create a new applet. And here you see where the name of the service comes from. If this, then that. I -F T T T. If a webhooks event occurs, then send a notification to my smartphone. That's all. Now we are safe. As soon as the value of the radioactivity is above, let's say 100, we get an alarm and can hide in a safer place. And if you warn all people around you, for sure you will be the hero. A nerd hero, like Mark Zuckerberg, just not so rich. We can also combine our two services with other services on IFTTT. I am, for example, warned if we will get rain tomorrow. Handy, but of course not as exclusive as an atomic bomb warning. Today we accomplished quite a lot. We built a Geiger counter using a pre-built device. Some of us also know now how this device works. We were able to connect to ThingSpeak and log our data there. And we created an IFTT applet to send us a notification in case of emergency. I hope this will be the most unnecessary device we ever built. But for me, I learned a lot and had some fun. I hope you too. Bye.